I see suicide as an awfully tragic thing, and I don't think anyone can ever really put themselves in a position where they understand what someone is really feeling, the depths that they must be feeling, and, and, and how challenging that must be. Part of the Mandel's so rules are like you don't cry openly or express emotion except anger. You don't express any weakness or fear. You demonstrate power and control and view women as, as property and objects. Each of those things is actually creating a disconnection between us. Welcome to the Authentic Man podcast. I am your host, David Chambers. This is a podcast for men who want more and less from life. More deep connection, more emotional intelligence, more self-awareness, and more great sex. And less. Less heartache, less conflict, less overthinking, and less stress. Creating dating lives, sex lives, and relationships that are incredible and authentic. My deepest goal is that you, the listener, can take away what you hear in this podcast and apply it to your life so that you can experience greater happiness, transformational growth, deeper relationships, and profound sexual intimacy. I believe that as men, we are capable of so much more depth than we are shown or led to believe. So join me as we get deep into this. Welcome back to another episode of the Authentic Man podcast. I'm your host, David Chambers. Um, back again. <laughs> um, and today, you know, I'm diving into a topic uh, with today's guest really about something that I see a, a struggle for men, a big struggle for a lot of the men I work with, a lot of men that come to work with is around making like deep and meaningful male friendships. Um you know, it's very much as we get into the, in the in a podcast, it's very normal for men to have friendships that are not deep, not meaningful, or actually to really not have any real friends, um, have any friends that they can call upon when they're struggling, when they need to talk about something, when they're going through something emotional, and even people they can rely on to help them, give them advice. And this is a real uh, problem because it actually affects so many areas of life, like mental health, um, emotional well-being, um, physical well-being, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. And I talk a little bit about that during the episode. And the second thing we get into is really talking about shame and particularly shame around masculinity and, and how we as men often feel a lot of shame about being men and being masculine men and, you know, how we can start to shed that shame, how we can release that shame from our minds, from our beings. And uh, this week's guest gives a few tools that he's used personally. So it's a big journey that he's been on personally around, you know, releasing shame, dissolving shame so that it's not impacting him and, and the way that he's living. You know, just think to, think to yourself for a moment. It's like, how would I feel if I didn't feel any shame? Like, you know, especially kind of toxic shame where, you know, the shame about being yourself and it creates more shame because you feel shame. And um, what would your life be like without that? You know, how would that transform? How would that be? And before we jump into the episode, just to say again, you know, big thank you for listening, actually. Like, massive thank you for being a listener and so forth. Um, in this new season, especially. And I just love you to, you know, share the love, share the the episodes that you enjoy. If this, this episode, share it with someone, you know, share it with someone, you know, that needs to hear this, that will benefit and get value from listening to this, because it's so, so valuable when we share things that are of value to each other. Like I've had people share podcasts with me and it'd been incredibly, you know, valuable to me, change things in my relationship, change things in my life and even my business. So, you know, please uh, share the love. And also it'd be great to hear from you if you've enjoyed the episode. Um, you know, feel free to drop me a DM on Instagram or on um, email. You can get me at the authentic man underscore or email is hello at the authentic man. Always looking forward to hear from people as well as any recommendations for future topics. So, you know, as many times I get the pleasure of having guests back on the podcast, people have had wonderful conversations uh, within the past on podcasts or just in general. And today's guest is no different. We've talk, spoke to, spoken a good good number of times. I think we've been on podcasts at least four times together. One, which is a an absolutely well-downloaded one about where four men talk about sex, um, which is always, every so often someone shares on Instagram, it's like, this is a life-changing conversation. Um, we've talked on uh, my podcast before, and we think we talked about love, didn't we? We talked 
a group of us talked about love. Um, and I was on his podcast um, not too long ago at the time of recording. I don't know if that's been released, that episode, quite yet. So I'm not going to spoil what that is <laughs> that's about either. But um, today's guest, I'd like to welcome James Oliver. Thank you so much, man. Um, yeah, I was going to say, you're about to drop some some exclusives of uh, season one of, of uh, the new podcast, which we haven't released yet, but... Um, We'll we'll be doing so in the probably the next month or two, but um, no mate, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, we've done a few podcasts together, haven't we? Mm-hmm, it's uh, yeah. we've had, had had a good history there. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's a pleasure to it's always a pleasure to talk to you, mate. So thank you for having me on. No, no, it's my pleasure. And I guess for the the listeners' benefit, it'd be wonderful to hear like what is it what is it that you do? So um, that as a topic is ever, ever changing and unfolding. But, um, you know, I'm at the moment, I'm, and I've recently made the decision to, I'm a coach, you know, I, I help people in kind of all facets of life. The majority of the work that I do is around, um, helping people in relationships, in their relationship to themselves, relationship with, with, with others, um, intimate relationships, friendships. Um, and I've recently decided to kind of niche, um, and specialize in working with men. And, um, yeah, I've, I've, so I've been doing, I, I've been in kind of in the men's workspace now, sort of intentionally full-time coaching for yeah about a month or two. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a wild ride. I love it. It's my purpose and all that good stuff. Like it lights me up. It, it really, really makes me, um, yeah, makes me happy. And, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, uh, yeah, I love it. So, that's a little bit mm. about me. <laughs> mm, beautiful. And I know, you know, obviously you've known each other probably going on three plus years now. And, you know, you've been in a space of of talking about men's issues, talking about men's mental health and so forth for, for, for a while. Mm. And again, also it's lovely. To, I always love to hear people's journeys. Like what brought them? What was the journey that took us from wherever we were in the past that brought us, you know, along this weaving and winding road to, you know, to be a coach, to be a, a men's work facilitator, a practitioner, you know, supporting people. And what was what was your journey? Um, yeah, it's a good question. It, it comes at a, quite a, a pertinent time for me. Um, I when was it? So, I mean, it was yesterday. Was the five year anniversary of of losing a really dear friend of mine to suicide, and um, back in twenty eighteen when, when Harry passed away. I'd been on my own journey with kind of exploring and learning a lot about myself. I'd been struggling with depression and anxiety sort of chronically for two or three years at that time, you know, that time. And I remember that, that moment and, 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 you know, going through that as, I mean, at the time I was 20, yeah, I was 27 at the time and going through that experience caused quite a seismic shift in my own like where I was investing my time and energy, I, I was still doing my work, but all of a sudden I just became aware of, you know, the statistics around male suicide, the conversations that I were having were shifting, you know, to, you know, things like the quality of male friendships, um, yeah, male loneliness. And I remember kind of waking up for want of a better term to a lot of the challenges that I had experienced in my own friendship groups and the way that I had learned to be a man, what I taught to cut, what I'd been taught to value as a man. Um, it was actually, I know yesterday, as I say, it was a five year anniversary of losing Harry. I went and sat in a beautiful spot that we used to, you know, we go there just to kind of celebrate and, and grieve. And, um, I usually go there. Yeah. The second of May every year. And, um, I sat and I looked through, I actually still have our old WhatsApp conversations and I scrolled through and, you know, I looked at the things that, that he and I would say to each other and the values that we shared and, and the things that we would say to each other to validate each other and make each other laugh. And, you know, without shaming he or, or myself at all, you know, so much of it was performative. So much of it was causing ourselves harm. You know, we were really disconnected from our hearts. We didn't understand, I think, authenticity. I don't think we understood vulnerability. I think we understood that, you know, I, at the time, I remember I, I, it was weird. 
he was celebrating and he would often validate me for being quite promiscuous. You know, at the time I was single and I was, you know, having a lot of sex and I could, I, I read those messages back and I could see how much he was kind of celebrating me for doing that and kind of pedestalling me a little bit. And yeah, just the values that, that, that we shared as men, um, that I don't think, you know, were unique to us. I think they're very, very common. I think it's how we're raised as men, particularly in whether we say the Western world or this country, but, um, yeah, just, you know, losing Harry was, was a big, a big thing that shifted my awareness and my attention. And over the next couple of years, I started, yeah, leaning, leaning into conversations around mental health, sharing my own journey. And, um, yeah, back at the beginning of lockdown, I started uh, an Instagram account called the honest bloke, which was all around kind of exactly what it says on the tin. Um, you know, a bloke, I wanted to kind of appeal to the everyday bloke who struggles emotionally, um, struggles with certain things in life and just share my experiences. So yeah, that was kind of my, my venture into men's work or speaking to men's issues and, yeah, I, I remember actually a couple of years ago, I sort of reached a point where I wanted to start really creating and helping and supporting men. But I, I realized that I still had quite a lot of work to do. I had a lot of resistance come up and I realized that I couldn't take men as deeply as I wanted to go with their healing and with their awareness because I hadn't quite gone there myself. Um, so yeah, kind of 2021, 2022 did a whole, whole deep load of like difficult, challenging, like deep, dark, horrible healing around like my shame and all sorts of, yeah, all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, it's, it's kind of led me to, to where I am now and, and, and helping men kind of go on a similar journey really. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And it's often, I mean, it's face like a really difficult time kind of catapults, catapults us into another it kind of breaks through a ceiling doesn't it i see like oh man I, this is the way i've been being and actually shit this is really not who i want to be this is really not how i want to be um mm. and it gives us the opportunity to shift and reevaluate our values and the way that we're showing up in life and you know it's beautiful yeah. to hear that that you know sadly that opportunity came from the, the the passing of a friend but it feels like what you're saying there is that you've really taken that as a way of like evolving and growing as a man Mm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, I, I don't look to, I don't look to take lessons from, you know, losing Harry, like, just to make myself my, you know, just to sort of like, soothe the pain and like bypass the pain. You know, I, I deeply grieve and I, I, I feel so much sadness for myself, for family, friends, everyone that knew him, and anyone who loses someone to suicide and you know, it's, as I say, it, it really kind of definitely, it changed me, uh, forever. Um, so I don't, I don't look for lessons and like takeaways and like ways of reframing things just to make myself feel better. But man, like if you can hold both and you can feel and grieve and be sad, but also look for like the beauty in it. Um, it's taught me so much about, and I'm sure, you know, we'll have some conversations about like my journey with shame and, and, and that side of things. But like unshaming death, unshaming suicide, you know, um, I, I see suicide as an, you know, an awfully tragic thing. Um, and I don't think anyone can ever really put themselves in a position where they understand what someone, you know, is really feeling the depths that they must be feeling and, and, and how challenging that must be. But, you know, I sat, sat on this spot yesterday and I, I felt so much love and relief that he wasn't suffering which, you know, I never, never want to say that to like glamorize or glorify suicide, but there's a very real, um, a very real pain that, that stopped in that moment. And, you know, I'm grateful that he's no longer in that pain. So yeah, lots endless lessons. And I've no doubt that I'll continue, you know, every year that I go back or every time I think of him or every time me and the boys talk about him. Yeah. I'll continue to continue to learn, learn more and take more from it. Mm. Mm. yeah yeah I guess I've never really looked at it so much in that way like you know suicide there's a pain at least it, it's ended it's not obviously it's a tragedy but there's also that to be grateful for you know 
there's often something yeah. to be grateful for in life, even mm. in the darkest of times. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's also, there's so many ideas, you know, sort of what feel like opposing ideas here, but also, you know, it's important to say that that pain has stopped in him. Mm. Naturally, that pain has somewhat passed, if not amplified or multiplied in those that loved him. Um, so, you know, yeah, it's, it's not that it's, it's all good, but you know, where we, where we can find, um, where we can find sort of glimmers in something that's quite dark, I think, um, yeah, we should, we should take those if we can. Mm. 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 And I guess we'll, since we're talking about friendship, male friendship in particular, I thought I might start with a, a, a little statistic that I, you know, was doing the rounds for a while now, which is basically that 30 years ago, 55% of men reported having six or more close friends. Mm. Right? And now 15% of men report having no close friends at all. Right. Wow. Men reporting they have close friends is down to, I think, about 24, 25%. So we kind of have this situation where men are lacking the kind of close friendships that they used to have historically. And then we've got this rise in, in suicide as well. Um, there's also various statistics about men's like loneliness. You know, I know there was a study, I can't remember exactly the numbers from the UK or maybe even just in London. It was, you know, like 25% of people. Uh, feeling lonely and I imagine a large majority of those are are men as well mm. and I guess the start you know what's what are your thoughts on why men have kind of struggled with friendship uh in this way and experiencing this loneliness yeah it's a it's a, a great question mate I think um and this this isn't really a concept that I've like made really clear in my mind but the first thing like that springs to mind when you say that is that we're taught friendship all wrong you know we learn friendship and the kind of like the foundations of friendship if you if you you know want to call it that um they aren't the yeah the foundations of friendship are not they don't promote things like authenticity they don't promote connection they don't promote vulnerability they pro i mean they have some great foundations like like banter and fun and silliness um but i think that those actually should be more of a a secondary like if you were to look at it like a bit of a pyramid those shouldn't be on the bottom as the foundations of what forms friendships you know what what forms sort of really solid really good male friendships um, you know, my, my experience or my, my feelings on, uh, you know, my, my own experiences with male friendships are that I, yeah, I, I've, I've definitely experienced, I, I've, I've been in circles of friendships where, you know, it's all about banter. It's all about having fun. It's all about drinking. It's all about recreational drugs. It's all about all of those sorts of things. Right. And actually when you drill down into it every single aspect of those things is all about disconnection so each of those things is actually disconnecting us or creating uh, like a divide or a, a disconnection between us so yeah i think that in a world where we're kind of we're, we're, we're waking up to a lot of this stuff but you know that, I think that's that's great if it's being taught, you know, if we're teaching children in schools and we're teaching, you know, we're raising children to, you know, connect, you know, we teach them values around kindness, if we teach them values around non-judgment, if we teach them around discernment, all of these sorts of things, and we teach them, we actually educate and support our children to have really good, authentic, really, like, those, those real good friendships with those foundations – then that's great. But I think, you know, we are still way behind that. You know, it's like, what about the men in their twenties? What about the men in their thirties? You know, teenagers now, um, but you know, all the way through those generations, I think you've got so many men who actually were not taught those things. We're actually taught that 
connection, vulnerability are things to be ridiculed for in male friendships and in, in social circles that are made up of men. I think we've set, yeah, we've set, we've set so many men up for like harm. I think we've just set them up to fail and we have, yeah, we're in this kind of position where it's like, how, how do we support men and help them find these friendships? How do we help them curate these friendships within their existing social circles? Um, my own experience of that is that I've, I think I tried for quite some time. I got, I got you know, when I started realizing that my friendships weren't serving me, I like, I, I spent, I, I sort of distanced myself subconsciously. I walked away from them. Then I went back and I tried to bring, bring back my knowledge and my passion around learning about who I am and all of that stuff. And, you know, it wasn't maybe received that well. I think I was very, very sensitive to their judgment. And, you know, I don't get me wrong. I have compassion for them because, you know, their friend who always acted a certain way and said certain things has kind of walked away and come back and started saying a whole bunch of different stuff that actually is probably very confronting for them. Probably feels like I'm calling them out. Probably feels like I'm judging them. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, I've been on a bit of a journey with that side of things, but I've also actively pursued new friendships um and found new friendships through <clears throat> a lot of them have come through social media a lot of them have come through you know creating a space you know the honest bloke instagram page was a gift to me because where i was learning how to show up authentically and express parts of myself that i'd hidden and be vulnerable other men who craved that gravitated towards me you know, they didn't know me from beforehand. They didn't have 10 to 15 years of friendship with me as that version of myself that when they saw me acting in a certain different way, it didn't challenge them. Mm. So, you know, like you, like, you know, Jamie and Ben and all these wonderful men that, <clears throat> you know, we've been on podcasts together with. Um, that was, that for me was, was a beautiful thing to be able to create connections, you know, in the DMs or on podcasts where we were just saying like, Hey man, you seem really fucking cool. I'd really love to have a conversation with you or I would love to spend some time with you. And I have like, I've had like, like for want of a better term mandates, like zoom mandates where I'm just like, you're cool. I want to talk to you. I want to know about you. Tell me about yourself. Like, and we jump on a call and we connect and we have these conversations. Right. But it's not that simple for everyone. It's not that simple for men who have, yeah, spent their whole life feeling as though desiring more depth, desiring more intimacy, desiring more connection with men is something that they will be laughed at for, something that they'll be shamed for, something that they'll be judged for, potentially humiliated for. So, yeah, it's we've we're in this culture, in this environment where authentic, deep male friendships are it's what men need and it is what they want, but they are dramatically ill-equipped and unsupported to create them and find them. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say that much of what you say, I see not just in my own life, but also in my coaching work with, with the clients I work with. And I, I remember having a conversation with a guy, um, Mark Green, Remaking Mankind. No, mm -hmm. Remaking Manhood, sorry, on Instagram. And we talked about the man box. And one of the pieces we talked about in that episode was how, you know, a lot of the rules of the man box around, you know, not showing any emotion, not um, expressing weakness, not asking for any help, um, being dominant and so forth. Don't just contribute to, you know, what we commonly know as toxic masculinity, but it also contributes to the harming of men creating relationships. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I feel was really clear, even in what you said, is that men often view relationships as being something that's feminine and lesser than, less of importance, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. And they treat it as such, like you said, like if there's 
they they treat it as like this has to be fun all the time and it has to be banter and it's like don't talk about anything serious like don't try and be too deep um um the banter also really not even such verges on and creeps into shaming and bullying of of people as well often not from a point of view of of spite but it still does fall into the category of kind of bullying and shaming and it's it's interesting to see that you're like okay that's how we create really toxic romantic relationships as well right we don't and it's not uh, a conscious thing it's just like you said men are not equipped and schooled in the way of creating intimate male friendship that like, has depth meaning um honesty challenge you know all the things that we actually need as men to kind of to grow so that it leaves men with all these friendships that lack any real substance so even if they had a few friendships right they they they're feeling lonely because like they can't go to anyone for any emotional support because the men they know don't know how to give emotional support and they don't know how to ask for emotional support on top of that um mm-hmm. leaving people feeling lonely but i also think that we can't overlook the fact as well of like we live in more of an internet age, right? More and more. And, you know, we're, you know, I think we're a few years apart, but like we, I remember playing in the street, right? <laughs> I remember playing in yeah. the street, playing football in the street. I, I grew up on the council estates, but it's even better. We didn't run on the street. There was a big concrete area <laughs> that was literally just concrete and you could <laughs> kick a ball around, put a couple of jackets down and all this kind of jazz. And, those were some really beautiful bonding times for, for me as a young boy. And then I, lucky enough, I did sport and I played cricket and I played football and all sorts. So I, you know, was always involved around friendships, but now in this internet age, and not to say that, you know, I had my, my, my nest and my SNES from a young age, but in this internet age, kids are getting mobile phones at eight years old. Yeah. Do you know, I imagine participation in sport is probably dropped down quite a bit kids get deep into playing video games and that's all they do with their time. Right? So all their interactions with other humans come through a screen, through another screen. And I wonder if this has an effect on their ability to socially engage with other people and create these relationships leading all, often to their, their loneliness as well. I wonder what your thoughts yeah. are. Yeah, man. That's only, you know, talking about like when we go back and by the way, yeah, like, we're, we're a few years apart, but man, I played in the street. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that was, that, that's just, that's like the quintessential childhood, isn't it? Like that's, I, and I think when we look back at that, we value that so highly. Right. Um, and you talked about like handing or like getting, um, yeah, like getting, getting devices into the hands of kids. I mean, like, ch- like infants now, what do we give an infant to distract them? We give them a phone with a video, we give them an iPad. So mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that causes tremendous harm. Um, and, you know, we're also, I guess we're in an age where parents also are more stressed and having more sort of just loaded onto them to which they can't be as present and supportive with their child. So it makes sense that they hand them, you know, the phone, the iPad. But, um, yeah, I think I think that, that the, I think that, yeah, the whole like, it needs, we need, like we, like we need intimacy, we need connection, but it needs to be in person, you know, um, yes, phones and yes, social media, they connect us, but they also give us a safe space to hide Mm. when we, when we don't want to, um, don't want to be seen when we don't want to be heard, you know, it's, we, like we don't notice what we don't see right so let's just say you went into a black hole of like darkness and depression and you, so, you let's just say for a month you your little circle at the top of instagram doesn't pop up on my screen am i going to mm. notice that mm. like no way like i love you but like and it's nothing to do with you <laughs> but like there is there is a very very small chance that i'm going to sit there and go christ do you know who i haven't seen in a while i haven't seen david putting stories on. I haven't seen, um, I haven't seen him sharing his podcast episodes. I haven't seen his content because I'm so inundated and overloaded and overwhelmed with everyone's content that is designed to keep me overwhelmed, designed to keep me addicted. And I'm not going to see that. So, you know, I, 
yeah, I think that, that physical spaces, like in person, like whether it's events, in person, get togethers, like are, are vital. They are absolutely vital for connection, for friendships, for, you know, I think that we, you know, we can sit down and have a conversation, right? And I think you and I, who are probably quite self aware, quite, um, yeah, quite conscious men, you know, I, I might be able to sense maybe some inauthenticity in you or vice versa, because I think we're quite somatically aware, right? We understand body language, we understand like the energy that someone presents. But it's way harder. If I feel like you're keeping something from me in a conversation, I'm probably going to notice it way. I'm going to be I'm going to be really in tune with you if we're sat in a room and we're sat opposite each other in a coffee shop or going for a walk or we're in person. Like I'm going to be able to know that there's something that you're holding back or something that's on your mind or on your heart that you want to share with me, but that you're feeling scared to share with me. If we're on the phone and I can't see you, it's going to be a lot easier for you to kind of be like, no, no, I'm good, man. How are you? How are you? What's going on with you? And just distract and deflect. So yeah, I think in person stuff and I'm, being in physical spaces surrounded by other men is like paramount, paramount to our connection, paramount to our healing um, and just, yeah, building, building good friendships. Mm. Yeah. That in-person element is, is really important. And it's, it's interesting. I don't know what your experience with m- m- male friendships. I find that um, often men can be really bad at the kind of, keeping in contact. I have a, a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine. We've known each other for the best part of over 20, 25 years, actually. We've been friends. And he's terrible in a text message exchange, actually. Mm-hmm. Like if I'm like to him, hey man, how are you? He's like, good. I'm good. You? And it'll be literally like, good dot, the letter U question mark. And, I'm, and I'll expand a bit and I'll be like, oh, you know, Business has been going all right. Um, actually, I, you know, I'm worrying about money a little bit and things in my relationship are good, but we're having these kind of conversations and concerns and blah, blah, blah. And he'll be like, you know, it's cool, man. Business is going to be all good. Relations will be all good. And you're like, okay, cool. <laughs> and, you know, maybe I'll ask him another question. Like, okay, how's your missus doing? Like, how's your new job going? And blah, blah, blah. And the conversation can often feel really like, it just doesn't go anywhere. Right. Mm. Or, and with him and, you know, he's, if I send him a message, he'll usually reply in two hours. Whereas I'm, you know, and I put my hands up there. Sometimes I'll take like a day plus to get back to people. Um, just with, with, you know, it's very normal for me to look at my, at my WhatsApp and see 24 unread messages at any given time. Right. That's a very normal yeah. thing for me. It's not personal to anybody. It's just that like, <laughs> I'm having to deal with a load Just of emails. Public apology to everyone. Yeah, now yeah, yeah. Ever. yeah. <laughs> it's like I've got emails, I've got Instagram messages, I've got WhatsApp messages, Signal messages, um, even some things on um, Telegram. So I might take a little bit of a while to get back, but I, I, I'm always, I always reply, and I'll even suggest a call. But I find often with men is that there's like a lack of desire or a lack of ability to really engage in meaningful conversation when it comes to like whether it is text message, but even sometimes in person. Like, and imagine mm. as you've gone on this journey that you've been on plus becoming a coach, because I think that's really shifted for me after I qualified as a coach and I qualified and I started coaching people a lot. I realized how little a lot of my male friends ask meaningful questions about the things that I've spoken about and what yeah. I receive in, in response to a lot of things is judgment, <clears throat> critique, um, their opinion, or just like, oh man, don't worry, it'll be, be fine, which I guess is technically their opinion. Mm. And actually that really, and I've really seen it in the last probably six to nine months more than any point mm. with with some of my friends where I've got male, some of my male friends I've known for many years have gone on a journey themselves. And with some of my friends who haven't, and like the difference in talking to them. And sometimes it's been them all together at the same time. And you've got one friend who's like, oh, so you're doing this breathwork thing now. Like, how, how did you train with that? What, did that? what was that like? What's some of the results you get with clients? What do you get out of it? And then they'll just be like, oh, breathwork, that sounds stupid. 
And you're like, wow, <laughs> <laughs> this is such an interesting conversation. And, yeah, for sure. You know, I see how that's detrimental to um, now friendship. But again, I'm interested in like, mm. you know, possibly your experience, even the experience of, of your of your clients with that, that kind of, the, the the way in which male friendships often are centered around or p- friendship in general, because this is people. It's like, it's not yeah. curiosity. It's judgment. We receive yeah. a lot of judgment instead of curiosity about <clears> ourselves. <throat> and that really affects the quality of the ability of our quality of our friendships. Yeah. Yeah. I think as you were speaking there, I noticed like, so whether it's, there were, there were two things that I think there is that one is, is that men don't have the skills to open like to ask open questions or to open up the conversation and they also don't have the like the safety in their own body they don't feel safe opening up vulnerable vulnerable conversations so you know whether it is judgment whether it's an opinion whether it's brushing something off like yeah man don't worry you'll be fine a lot of that i feel is driven by a subconscious desire to close that conversation to create safety i.e there's vulnerability here, there's emotion here, there's depth here, there's potentially some, you know, my friend is telling me how he's finding his relationship difficult, or he's expressing, I can feel that he's hinting or it's a desire to share with me to unload to to almost to unburden himself. And really, you know, he's looking for someone to hold space for him, and to listen. And, you know, what's the typical thing that men do when someone does that is they offer advice. They give you the solution. They go, here's what you should do. And often, more often than not, that is actually driven by a subconscious desire to get out of the conversation. So, you know, it's, yeah, for me, it's this this trend of closing conversations rather than opening them. You use the word curiosity. And obviously, you and I know within the work that we do, whether it's with our clients or whether it's in within ourselves, whether it's you know, the yeah, conversations we have with our friends, right? We know that curiosity is just the most incredible virtue, right? But curiosity, curiosity by definition implies that we don't know everything about the thing we're talking about. We're taught mm-hmm. like we're looking for things that we don't know. So to be curious is like, what am I missing here? What don't I understand about this? What, what more can I learn here? Mm-hmm. And that is in direct conflict with the way that many men are raised. And that is that in our, our value is in being right and, you know, being like, like whether it's winning, being right, being the best. So to demonstrate that you don't understand something or you don't know something or you want to learn more about something is kind of like considered weak. So, you know, curiosity is... Again, you and I will know this, right? And many will know this hearing this is that curiosity is just the gateway to such a deep understanding and such a it's it's a beautiful, beautiful practice and a an incredible lens to to adopt and, and view life through. But it comes in yeah, in sort of contrast or in resistance to what men are taught they should be. So I think that's probably where men typically like, yeah, they just try and shut stuff down. Yeah, here's what you should do. Um, you'll be fine. And it's just, yeah, it's it's actually driven by their own discomfort. Mm, it's, it's, it's like I've always kind of seen it, very similar to what you're saying there, where you bring like a conversation and it's almost like the what you're talking about is creating uncomfortable emotions in the body of your friend or friends. And unconsciously for them, that these uncomfortable emotions, they want them to go away. They don't want these emotions currently in their system feeling this. So they do exactly what you're saying is they offer advice. They tell you it's going to be fine because it's almost like, no, I don't want this. I don't want this in my space right now. And there's that that kind of sense that we get strangely. I think we also then receive that as like, who I am isn't welcome. My opinions, my experience isn't important, right? And we kind of all get into you know, in groups of friendships that like almost we learn it's like, well, if I'm going to bring something that's not fun and joyful and banter, like, and talking about how many women I slept with or how good the sex is, all other things become non-welcome. And it's almost this, um, 
partitioning. It's like, these are the parts of who I am that are welcome in this friendship and these friendships. And these are the parts of me that aren't welcome. And there must be something wrong with these parts of me um, because I also struggle with these parts of me. So I should hide these parts of me from my friends and also myself, which has quite, um, can have really a negatively profound impact on our lives. Mm. Yeah, Ab- absolutely. Like when, you know, the part of us that I think as well, like we talked about the skills that men have, right? Men, men are taught to value being like problem solvers and fixers. So subconsciously, like we say, the motivation is to distance themselves from difficult emotions. I think also down like under the surface, there's, there is a positive intention with the skills that men have offering solutions is what they feel they are doing to help. Yes. So this is not, this is important, right? We don't shame men who can only offer solutions, but we understand why they can't sit with the young, the discomfort of the, the awkward, challenging, emotionally vulnerable conversations. So yeah, I think it's, there is a positive intention there as much as there is a, a subconscious um, intention to, which I guess is also a positive protection, sorry, positive intention, is to protect themselves. Mm. This is unsafe. This conversation, this vulnerability, these emotions are not safe within, they're not safe, I'm not safe here. So I'm going to offer a solution, shut it down. But of course, yeah, positive intention the negative impact is that it dismisses the other person, it gaslights the other person, makes them feel like their feelings aren't valid or safe to be expressed, and their needs their needs go unmet in that in that interaction or that exchange, don't they? So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's no, important. It's really true. You know, there's that, <clears throat> as you said, there's not a there's the, the intention is 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 almost there's a tension of love. You know, if I give you this advice, this is. To me, this is the greatest gift I can give you. I can give mm. you advice. I can tell you that everything's going to be all right. Because there's not a, maybe a conscious understanding that listening and kind of holding space, as, as we often call it, is actually the gift that we can give to our brothers as well that can be equally and sometimes more valuable than any advice or pick-me-up words. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, one of the most valuable um tools or skills that you that anyone can learn but particularly men is you know in in any scenario where someone is sharing or unburdening or just saying what's on their mind or on their heart or whatever it might be is ask them do you want me to listen or do you want me to help do you want do you, do you want do you want me to offer solutions here or do you just need me to sit with you and listen to you just simple as that because if you ask that question, sometimes they might be looking for your advice. Sometimes they might be looking for solutions. But if you if you don't ask and you give them solutions, and that's not what they were looking for. We know it's, it's dismissive. It bypasses that person's pain, makes them feel completely invalidated and unseen. Um, yeah, just ask. So simple. But again, like that is, you know, we talked about the skills that men are not raised with and educated on. That That's a real simple one, isn't it? Like when you, mm-hmm. when you think about it, but if you think about when you were taught to do that, you won't be able to find it because we weren't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause no one's saying to you, uh, oh, when someone shares and they're talking, notice whether there's a request for advice or whether they're just saying how they feel. And if you're mm-hmm. unsure on that, maybe you should check in with them and get consent. I guess technically this is consent, is it? It's like, yep. what are you looking at? Are you wanting me to just listen to you or are you looking for some advice or some coaching or something like that? It's like, it's that mm. level that we're never really told because there's no, um, no one's thinking about listening to each other in that way. Really? It's like a level yeah. of, of depth of listening. that it's not just missing in men, really. It's a societal missing really, isn't it? Of depth of Absolutely. listening, <laughs> but no, no, I, I completely agree with you it's like we don't no one's teaching us no one sits us down at home and our parents go you know i'm sure there's some parents that do this right (laughs) um to their children like okay so you're saying so that the so-and-so broke your toys at school okay cool yeah and Mm -hmm. this happened this happened so do you want me to do you just want me to listen to you or do you want me to do something would you like me to try and fix this problem for you in some way giving the child to an option at like you know six seven eight nine ten eleven years old to go no, no, I can sort it out. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. So you just want me to listen. Yeah. 
okay, so what else happened? You know, and because that's the kind of schooling, isn't it? It's the modeling of the the experience that we want them to start to create for themselves. Um, mm. So I guess the question leads on to my next thought is like, and we touched on it a few places, but it's nice to just have it like a in, in, in one place on the podcast with people. It's like, what can men do to cultivate better friendships, whether that's finding friendships or deepening the ones that they have? Yeah, this is, this is a great question because within my experience, I have, I think I've kind of gone full circle with it. Like I noticed that my current friendships, you know, a few years ago weren't, weren't serving me. They didn't feel good. And I noticed a need for more, a desire for more depth, more connection, more authenticity. And I felt really scared of trying to create that in my current environment. Like I wasn't, it was, it was too uncomfortable for me personally. So yeah, you know, I, I sought them elsewhere. You know, I think, I think things like men's circles and men's communities are becoming more, um, more kind of mainstream and more accessible and less shamed or judged. Um, I still think there's a long way to go with that. Um, you know, me and me and my friend Harry have recently started like our own, you know, men's community. We have men's circles, community calls, you know, events, and the feedback that we get just from you know 10, 10 men jumping on a call on a Wednesday night with relatively little agenda where we sit and just share and communicate and talk about what's on our minds and what we're going through is profound. Mm. It's unbelievable. The feedback that men have just to sit in a space and hear men share what's going on in their lives. Um, so I think that, you know, men's communities, men's circles, you know, they're, they're, I mean, yeah, they're, they're not advertised on TV. Like you, you'll have to probably do a little bit of digging to find them, but you know, with the internet, this, these places and these, communities are, are really accessible um like mine and harry's is called one brotherhood and it's very much designed to welcome anyone and everyone that identifies as male um we are all brothers that is the message that's the ethos that's the philosophy and you know um you and i for example we had a beautiful conversation on uh my podcast and mine and jamie's podcast which happy to share a bit now um bit of a teaser but, um, you know, we had a beautiful conversation around our experiences as men and the similarities in those experiences, but also the differences in those experiences through the lens of our race. Mm-hmm. You know, so many of us like in, in conversations online or wherever it might be, we make these generalistic, very sweeping statements. Right. Men, this women, that. Mm-hmm. And I often think it's so easy for me to sit and talk about men's mental health or men's shame right but there is so much about your experience as a black man that you will have experienced shame for that i do not have a clue about Mm. i am ignorant just by my own experience and the color of my skin and the environments i've been raised in that i don't understand so there's a beauty when you get together and have these conversations with men as i say whether it's in a men's circle whether it's in a community whether it's you know, an intentional conversation with your current friendships where you message your group chat and you say, Hey guys, a little bit of an idea. I'd love it. If once a month we can get together, you know, on a weekday evening or on a Sunday or whatever it might be. And we get together and we just connect. We talk about what's going on in our lives. Um, I just love to create a space where we can talk about some real shit, you know, rather than the stuff that might predominantly come up in the typical ways that we interact which is more banter based or less more surface level so um yeah i think you have to be like men have to first of all become aware that that's what they need um which we all do we're humans and we desire connection we need connection not just yeah like you said intimacy connection is there's nothing overtly feminine about it like it's part of our it's part of our nature as humans and then, yeah, actively go out and create these, like seek out these environments. Um, like I say, that's that's probably the best ways that I would say you can do it. Cr- look for a new environment like a men's circle. Or if you feel as though you there's there's a possibility of it, you know, being received 
um, and you feel like it, you could facilitate just a once a month dinner or like a, an evening at the pub with the boys, but you do it and you say the intention behind this is for us to get together and just share and talk and figure out what's going on in our lives. Like that to me a few years ago would have felt really scary and would have felt really like, but you know, nowadays I feel really comfortable having these conversations with the men in my life. So mm -hmm. yeah, but like I say, it's, it's, I think you have to take it upon yourself to go out and find and create these connections, which is scary, but you know, we need it. And it's, um, yeah, like we know why men are uncomfortable doing it, but on the other side of it is just the most, there's so much healing and there's so much beauty in that, you know, seeing men just share and connect with, with that, like that, that depth and that vulnerability. So I have another program coming up in September. 12 week program this time because I see a lot of men desiring to show up in their lives with more leadership, more expression, more connection, more depth, more openness. So I have my program being an authentic masculine man. And in this program, really, I help men cultivate the depth they want, the deep presence and self-awareness that they, they haven't been able to find on their own to really express themselves more openly and more honestly through the program, men have really shed a lot of shame, been able to show up powerfully in their relationships, been able to express themselves and feel confident in their dating lives and really let go of a lot of sexual shame as well. And this is just the content, right? The, like I said, the, the men that have been on the program in the past, you know, they've come back and said it's completely changed their lives. It's helped them build new relationships and friendships with depth and with honesty of openness that they never thought was possible. So if you're interested in this program, which is going to be starting in September for 12 weeks, go into the show notes and you can find all the details to sign up and we'll have a conversation about how you can jump on. Mm. I'm a big proponent of, of men's circles. Um, I'm doing some work now with a company called men's circle. Um, I actually, if, a couple of weeks ago, I facilitated a um, theme circle about sex and intimacy. Nice. And it was amazing to see how a group of strangers, men who didn't know each other at all before they come on the call, started to open up and share about their fears and worries and concerns around sex and intimacy. And what was really profound was where after we went round the circle completely, how much of our experiences were very similar. Our fears, our worries, our concerns, the things that are not going the way that we want were very similar. And this was a shock to a lot of the men that were sitting there. At the end, they were like, wow, I'm not alone. Like, oh, you're having these thoughts as well. Like, oh shit, I'm not alone. And the at the end, everybody said, like, man, I feel like a weight's been lifted off me by simply just being here and talking and sharing and hearing other people speak. And I know that often men feel like, what's the point in talking, right? No one's listening. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I, as I said before, I don't think we're very schooled or very, very good at listening. Um, but one of the first things we have to do if we want people to listen to us is we actually have to, well, A, learn to listen ourselves, but also request the sort of things we want, as you said before. And I guess inside the men's circle structure, you don't have to put much effort into creating you just need to show up and the structure holds you you know in a men's circle you show up it's been created by someone else and you can just follow along with the structure and allow yourself to kind of surrender to that yeah. um and you know it's definitely an easier way to meet new friends who are more open-minded and so forth and there's you know loads of different companies that run men's circle like i said there's online company called men's circle there's you know mankind project um, there's a, there's a lot of, like, if you're looking for a men's circle there, they're all over the place in different guises. And as you said, with the friends, it can be a little bit trickier, right? Because mm. we have to kind of go against what we've experienced before. Um, and I can definitely say that, you know, there's probably one or two friendships I look at and go, oh, I've really kind of shied away from being like, Hey, this is what I need from this friendship or this friendship isn't really going to get any deeper because mm. like I've shifted and changed the person. And obviously you've shifted and changed the person, but I actually want this friendship to continue and I want it to, to, to be deeper because that's a difficult conversation for us, right? That's uncomfortable. We, you know, someone could turn around and go, oh, you're being stupid, mate. What's wrong with you? You've changed and all this stuff. And I've heard all that. People told me I've changed and blah, blah, blah. But actually what you get on the back end of it is, is even more beautiful because you're with someone who's known you for many, many years, right? And it's, it's 
you know, I have one friend in particular and our, he went through some difficult times in the last couple of years and our friendship really shifted because he started to really go down his own healing journey and he basically called out to me. He was just like, I know, you're, I know you'll be able to listen. I know you'll be able to understand because you've been saying stuff like this to me for years and now I get what you're saying. I get, I get what you, you mean now. And our friendship has turned into something a lot deeper than it was before. And it's been really, really, um, it's been really nourishing to me in so many ways because I'm like, ah, we've known each other from when we were kicking ball when we were 13 years old, right? <laughs> but also, you know, I know you now, you know, mm-hmm. in your relationship, in your marriage and the stuff that's happened to you. And we can talk about the stuff about now and the past, but the lens that we now have with this, this depth, right? But a lot of that's come through, you know, his vulnerability, his openness, my vulnerability in sharing who I am becoming continuously through my journey, even when he didn't fully understand or even when he, you know, brought in the banter and laughed and joked. And, you know, it's not always easy, but actually it's been incredibly rewarding in, uh, for both of us, I imagine. Um, <clears throat> and I actually asked him, you know, there was even a moment where, we went for dinner a few months ago and he started to like tear up. He was telling me something and I, you know, I could see that he was struggling to stay present. I said, can I just walk you through a little exercise? And he was like, yeah. And I just walked him through something called orientating, which is just like bringing your body back into the moment, feeling the ground and, you know, sensing. So you can go back into your senses out of the mind and out of any wounding or trauma. And after that, he was just like, wow. That was so simple, but it really helped. I was like, oh, you're welcome, man. You know, no problem. He's like, man, just really grateful that I'm here with you and you are totally comfortable with this. And I'm like, yeah, man, it's cool. It's, 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 it's fine. But it takes for us to do that in our friendships. We have to take a little bit of courage. You know, we have to take some courage and a willingness to be vulnerable and to be kind of shot down and seen as, um, <clears throat> as odd or weird. Um, and also to kind of request what we want and need which I think mm. is also something that's often really difficult for men is to say, this is what I want and this is what I need. And I also understand that you can say no to this. Yeah. Uh, and it might be a boundary as well at the same time. Like, you know, if these things don't sh- shift for me, then, you know, X, Y, and Z. And not like I'm going to attack you, but it might be a case of saying, if we can't deepen this friendship, then this friendship really is going to stay as it is. And mm-hmm. I, you know, this is all of me you're going to get. Like I might not share certain aspects of my life and, and so forth. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it does take a level of courage and also, you know, developing the skills that, you know, you've mentioned around um, friendship, like listening, speaking, asking for what you want, setting boundaries, sharing yourself, your own vulnerability, you know, and maybe even saying, like, I'm just sharing right now. I don't need any advice from you or Mm. coaching. I just want you to listen. And be curious, yeah. maybe even ask, like just I just want you to ask questions that are curious so you understand more of my experience. Because that's the way that we start to shift and change our relationships. Because the chances are most of the, the men you know want more. They might not know consciously, but there's a part of them that's desiring for some more depth. They might be afraid, but you can be a kind of lighthouse to them to to bring that into their lives. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you said it about you know, it does take that courage and it does take, um, I think you need to be willing to risk rejection. Mm. You need to be willing to risk potentially, not always, but the friendship ending because it, it can kind of end, um, not necessarily forever, sometimes forever. But, you know, you said if this doesn't change, then the friendship will stay as it is. Sometimes it could be a firmer boundary. It could be, if this doesn't change, actually, I've realized that there are ways that you show up or or we interact in this friendship that are actually quite harmful and that they need to stop. And if they don't stop, then I don't want to be a part of this friendship anymore. I don't want to continue engaging in it. So I, I want to continue having a friendship with you. I want to <clears throat> continue this you know, journey that we've been on for however many years. Um, you know, I, I have this with, I have this with some friends in my life now where I've kind of just taken a step back, left the door kind of, you know, open, you know, I haven't set firm boundaries, but I'm kind of like, I'm, 
I don't really want to put myself in situations or social environments where I'm going to be expected to act like I used to or judged for how I act and say and speak and think now. Mm. Um, like you can come and meet me. Like I share, I, I, you know, I've got, yeah, I've got a podcast. I've got a social media account. I've got this, I've got that. Like I speak about my work. I, I share you know, stuff that's really important to me in, you know, on social media for anyone and everyone to see. Um, you like, you can show up, you can step in, you can drop me a DM, you can message me on WhatsApp, you can give me a call, you can talk to me about any of it. Like that'll always be open. But like, if I experience judgment or if I experience shaming or if I experience, you know, any of that from you guys, then like <clears throat> that's on you. I don't want to be a part of that anymore. Mm. Mm, it's a, and and it can be hard to do that you know it can be difficult to kind of set that with people and people don't always you know as someone who's come out and spoke very openly about his life I imagine you probably have this as well it's like some people really disapprove of the things you say some of your friends will be really like I found some of my friends like just basically spend all their time <clears throat> whenever they cont contact me through Instagram is like disagreeing and telling me where I'm wrong um mm about things or mocking things that I'm doing. And it's, it's, it has really been like, oh, wow. Like mm -hmm. this is how, and then when you come and say something like, Hey, like, why do you always do that? And they're like, oh man, I'm just, I'm just joking, man. Like chill out. Like why are you being so sensitive? And you're like, oh yeah. Okay. This old chestnut again. Yep. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to like ask you a question like, oh, you're so sensitive these days. You know, you used to be so like chilled, re relaxed and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, yeah. yeah, man, I just got a bit older. I just grew up a little bit and matured and talked about topics that are like meaningful and I can kind of hold it and I can talk about it. And I, mm -hmm. but, and and it's, that's the side that's difficult. And I think some, some of those friendships that in the past, I've definitely just, like you said, you just create a distance and you just go, you know, I'm here if you need me. And they come what, what I call kind of um, legacy friendships. Mm -hmm. I like, like we got history. We got history. We've known each other a long time. We'll catch up over some beverage <laughs> or or dinner, right? And we'll talk about old times in many ways. We'll talk about sport. We might talk about relationship. We might talk a little bit about the struggles we're, we're dealing with. Um, but I'm not going to call you when I'm in the midst of like real difficult troubles and I need someone to listen and maybe someone to advise me in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I can enjoy that friendship for what it, it becomes, you know, talking about old times and reminiscing and, you know, talking about current things. And I can enjoy that friendship for what it is. I can still bring most of who I am and maybe try and deepen it a little bit, but equally um, I have to be mindful of who the person I'm talking to. Like if I'm not going to come and be like, I don't know. I spoke to a friend of mine recently. We were talking about, um, uh, what's it called? Drag Queens Weeding Stories. Mm. And I, he was like, oh my God, there's this an agenda. They're trying to remove gender. That's the agenda. And I was like, no, nah, man, it's just Drag Queens Weeding Stories. He's like, it's confusing for children. I said, dude, it's confusing for you. Mm. Like, kids, kids just see someone dressed up in clothes, reading them a story. Like, in the same way that they dress up in their mum's dresses. Like, it's not confusing for them. It's just like, you know, maybe we should ask the children what they think. Oh no, they're trying to break down gender. Like, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, dude, this is really paranoid thinking you've got here. And I realized there was a point where I was getting quite angry. And I was like, this is another thing on the list. I would, we don't talk about this anymore. I didn't say it, but I was just like, we're not going to talk about this anymore. Cause you, <clears> your, <throat> my mind's open and compassionate to people and their experience. Your mind wants judgment and want to see where things are wrong. And what's right, yeah. what's right and wrong. And sometimes with friends, you just remove things off the table as conversations or when they come up, you just kind of go, yeah, man, cool. And yeah. you also decide to limit your kind of engagement with those people. It can be the same with family as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it doesn't yeah. mean you have to just completely let go of the friendship unless that's exactly what you want to do. Exactly. Um, yeah, something that kind of came up for me, yeah, when you were sharing there is like, we like the longer we have friendship, first of all, you know, we don't get taught that friendships might not last forever. We don't get mm -hmm. taught like, you know, usually when we get into something, 
comes up a lot when we talk about romantic relationships, but also with friendships is like, we don't learn about how long they might last or how they might peter out or how they might end and how to navigate them ending. But, you know, the, the practice of, of not attaching yourself to the story and the narrative of what you thought a friendship could be, you know, get that curious lens on, right? Oh, like what, what might happen next? Like, oh, I was, you know, when something happens or a, a shift in the dynamic of that relationship changes, get curious about it, you know, detach from where you thought your friendship was going to go. You know, I've got friends that I've been friends with for, yeah, probably best part of nearly 20 years now, you know, my oldest friends. And <clears throat> over the last couple of years, I've realized that actually the thing that was causing me pain in that friendship yes, was the, the the behavior and stuff, but it was actually the expectation that they wouldn't do it. Mm. Mm. It was the expectation that they could give me more depth. It was the expectation that when I would share with them and be vulnerable with them, they would be able to hold space for that. Yeah, I think that most of what causes us pain in these friendships is, the yeah, the behavior. It's the way that they act, you know, the judgment or the ridicule or them not holding space for you whatever it might be, but it's the expectation that they can do that or that they should do that for you. When they don't meet that expectation, that's the thing that causes you pain. And so I think, yeah, you know, we can, we can be upset that they can't do that, but actually if a lot of the times, yeah, in, in and this could be any relationships, right? I've had this in friendships, I've had this in partnerships. I've had that with family, definitely with parents is expecting a person to do something or give you something that they are not capable, willing, able mm. to, to give you. Well, your expectation is setting them up for failure. And that, you know, them failing you is, if we want to talk about like taking radical responsibility, them failing you is kind of on you. Mm. And that's what's causing you pain. So if you can drop the expectation, if you can let go of the expectation that your friend should be able to hold space for you, um, you know, understand you, not judge you. Well, let go of that judgment. So let go of that expectation, accept them, accept that they're going to judge you, accept that they don't know how to hold space, accept that they're going to offer you advice when you want them to listen. And Find new spaces to get those things. Find new people who can meet your needs and, and go and get those needs met elsewhere. Um, of course, you, yeah, you know, you absolutely can challenge. You can open up a conversation to, as you say, express a desire to deepen the conversation. Sorry, sorry deepen the friendship. Um, build those things that aren't there. But, yeah, let, let go of the expectation that they can or should be meeting those needs of yours and, yeah, meet them where they're at. I think that's probably the best best place to start with trying to trying to deepen friendships. Mm. Yeah, that's a really powerful point. It's the expectation of the should, you know. They should be mm. able to do this. They should be able to hear me. They should be able to be curious. They should be able to listen. When we allow ourselves to, as you said, to drop that, then... There's actually space <laughs> there in the friendship instead of our, and in many ways, that expectation is also leads to judgment of them. Every time, every time. And I've, I've done that. I think that's something that I have, I, I, you know, I can remember, I can remember these, these moments in really important friendships. Uh, so really important relationships in my life. The first one that I ever did, it was, was with my older brother and about five or six years ago, I remembered that I had been expecting him to be certain. He, I was expecting him to be this like superhero, big brother of mine. And I was expecting him to like, love me and like be this, yeah, kind of like role model slash all of these things to me. And then when he didn't meet those expectations, I'd get really upset with him and I'd judge him. Mm. I'd be angry at him, but I like, I would, I would really judge him. And I remembered then letting go of that and like accepting him for who he is and our relationship changed 
the way that we communicate changed and it you know definitely d- maybe doesn't go as deep and, and isn't as fulfilling as i would love it to be but it's more real hmm. and it's more there's there's more truth and there's more it feels safer it feels easier i've done it with my like i went on a big journey with my dad that i know you and i have spoken about previously um that's obviously a big one because you know when we grow up we our parents are are expected to meet all of our needs and then all of a sudden you know we realize they're human and we resent them and judge them and are triggered by them you know because they cause us a lot of emotional pain sometimes and then letting go of that and being able to just fully honor and respect the person that they are um or accept them for who they are and not expect them to do things and give you things that they are not capable of doing drop the expectation things will get easier so yeah Mm. and this is a you know (laughs) it almost doesn't need to be said but like you know dropping expectation in in relationships improves them massively but we can and you know this for listeners as well is like taking that on in your life in general of what Mm. you expect of people yeah especially what um the kind of unsaid expectations expectations you have in your head that you never say to someone like i you know i don't know something silly like i i expect you to open the door for me um, when I come round, even though I have a key, you know, we get annoyed about those things. It's like actually <clears> saying <throat> it out loud or dropping it is, is our, is our options really in those cases. And it's really, as you said, it's a really powerful point to improve, um, yeah. friendships. Mm, yeah, for sure, man. I think it gets easier. Like you, you're, you're not fighting someone to meet needs of yours that they can't meet. And then all of a sudden you're like, cool, well, I'll, I'll go elsewhere. I'll find someone else or I'll meet those needs myself, um, find some new people. And yeah, things, things just feel like they get a whole load easier. Mm, I definitely do. And then before we finish up, I think it'd be nice to, I know we wanted to talk about de-shaming masculinity and I still feel like this is something, a really important topic. And it's, you know, it's not too dissimilar from the friendship stuff. Mm. Um, and I know, you know, we both work with men, so we, you know, really see the the shame men carry around being men, masculinity. Yeah. Um, and this isn't necessarily a new phenomenon. I'm going to sit here and go, oh my God, it's only started happening in the last five, 10 years. Cause it hasn't. Cause I've read enough to know that. I don't know if you've read the book, um, fire in the belly. No, it's by Sam Keen. And it's written in like, I think it might be the late eighties. You know, it's kind of like the classical men's work type book. Um, and he's already talking about men feeling shame around masculinity, right? You know, he's really, he's really talking about, you know, going to men's groups and be in, and so forth and, and, and all that jazz and how he's run them for many years. Um, but I guess the question for yourself is, where do you see men feel, what are the kind of examples of shame that men feel about being men and being masculine men in particular that you kind of experience personally through friends or, mm. or through your clients? Yeah. I mean, it's earlier when we were talking about friendships, right? You mentioned there are certain parts of, um, there are certain parts that within male friendships and male, you know, social situations that are safe to express. And there are parts of ourselves that are not safe to express in those environments. Those are our shamed parts, right? Those are the parts of ourselves, our emotions, our experiences, the things that we think, feel, do, that are not safe to talk about or safe to express in those environments. And those are our shames. That's, that's our shame as men. Um, my shame with, uh, so my journey with shame personally, um, I mean, obviously goes way back, but in terms of when I became aware of shame as a topic and where I felt shame in my life was a couple of years ago. And it was all around how I was showing up in relationships and, you know, I, I remember it really clearly. Um, I was in a relationship at the time and I had just started really struggling, started really feeling awful, like a lot of self-loathing, a lot of inner critic stuff, just beating myself up internally, but really unkind to myself. And I sort of had a look at what was going on there and I realized that I was it came from a bit of perfectionism. Like when I'd reached that point in a relationship where, you know, honeymoon periods come and gone, you're left with 
the real shit of you know all of who you are the good the bad and there were parts of myself that i desperately didn't want to be seen by my partner i was keeping hidden but keeping those parts of me inside and shaming myself and feeling shame for those parts of me was just killing me it was absolutely tearing me apart and i remember i wrote a list down of all of these things and one of the areas that i was experiencing shame over was being attracted to other women whilst in a relationship and so there was this you know part of me that yeah was attracted to other women would feel feel attracted feel turned on um but because it was in my mind that wasn't okay i had to suppress that i had to hide it i had to pretend it didn't exist um and I mean, it, for example, it didn't manifest itself for me in cheating, but it would manifest its way, you know, in it would manifest itself in things like, you know, liking posts on Instagram, like so many men will do this, right? They're looking for <laughs> something, they're looking for, a, they're looking for a way of expressing that shamed part in a way that is like, covert, and people aren't going to see like, you know, but then your partner sees and she gets upset, and all that sort of stuff, right? So yeah, I realized that that was a big part of, of, of my shame was like, I'm attracted to women. And then I, I, di- I dove a bit deeper and I was like, okay, well, I'm attracted to women. And I kind of went through to not just how I relate with women, like in relationship, but also like sexual shame. Mm. So I think, you know, if we look at it on maybe uh, like a binary basis where we look at, you know, women and men, it's, it's safe to say that women are shamed for their sexuality i.e. having any level of sexual desire, sexual expression, sexual, yeah, like like they're shamed for having, ple- you know, for their pleasure. I think men, and my experience with my shame was that I was shamed for, like, it was almost because I was a man, my sexual expression is one of, I just want to fuck everything. Um, there's no, like, there's no... Um, I can't find the right words for this, but it was almost like I'm not allowed to have desires because those are those desires are shamed within men, right? It's almost like they're expected of you. You know, if, if you want to have a threesome or if you want to go to a sex party or if you want to, who knows, play around with sex toys, change, you know, play around with, with dynamics, get pegged, whatever it might be, right? <laughs> All of this stuff, there are things that men are not allowed to desire, not allowed to explore. And yeah, I realized I was like, fuck man, there's so much within my, there's so much within my sexual expression that has been stifled, that has been shamed that I have never explored. Um, that when, you know, about six months after like my shame list, um, you know, I wrote and shared it with my partner, that relationship ended. And I remembered saying to myself, I need to go all in on this. I need to like, I need to heal this shit. I need to explore it. I need to, yeah, like figure it out. And so I went on like for the rest of that year, which was like 2022, I said, I sat myself, I wrote myself a list and I was like, right, what things do I feel ashamed of that I wouldn't judge other people for, but I do judge myself for. And I was like, right, I want to go to a sex party. Um, I want to try, and I wrote a list down of like sexual experiences, like whether it was threesomes, whether it's whatever, right? And I went, yeah, I I went, I'm, I'm ashamed of these things because it's like wanting them, wanting them makes me a typical man. Mm. It makes me someone who doesn't, it's like you can't have intimacy in those environments. It's like those, wanting those things is just about, um, maybe getting validation from other men. It's all about ticking the box and, you know, being able to say, yeah, I did this, I did that. Actually, I did a whole bunch of stuff last year in this journey of exp- you know, experiencing these things and expressing myself and understanding who I was sexually and, you know, intimately that I haven't told people about. Like it was never, I, I sure as shit didn't talk to any of like the boys about it. And actually, you know, when I, 
began looking at how I relate with people. And, you know, I, I stepped into a new relationship later that year. We started looking at some, you know, non-traditional dynamics. We started looking at non-monogamy or like having an open aspect to our relationship. When I have shared that part with, you know, friends of mine, you said it earlier, you get met with judgment. Mm. And actually in... It, it's quite interesting because part of like the part of me that, you know, has always historically, I, you know, I said earlier, I looked back my, through my messages with me and my friend Harry, right? Five years ago, we talked about like who are, who we were sleeping with and how many women I'd slept with that month and all that sort of stuff, right? Very externally motivated. You know, they, I was driven by external validation there. When I was exploring, let's say, for example, going to sex parties, but from an intrinsic internal desire to understand and express who I am sexually. When I was then you know, bringing that up or talking about being in an open relationship with men from an intimate, from like an intimacy and from like a truth and an authenticity, it was just met with judgment because I wasn't sat there going, Oh, I fucking shagged like some X number of birds at this party. Like it wasn't that it was a, you know, there's more intimacy, more truth to that. So yeah, like, I mean, it's been tremendous in healing that shame in in me. It's been a beautiful experience for me. Um, And then, yeah, you know, as that sort of, I think that's been like my main, main area of shame. But, you know, I've since gone on to unpack things like I've been shamed over my self-expression. I've experienced shame in my life through my uh, intelligence. Um, I've been shamed through, yeah, just so many things. And I think that this, in, 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 in line with men and masculinity, it's anything outside of that man box, right? Mm. Um, anything, I've seen some of, uh, is, is it Mark's work? Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen some of Mark's work on the man box and it's a beautiful concept because anything outside of being this type of man who shows up in this type of way, who interacts with people in these sorts of environments, says these sorts of things, anything outside of that, men will likely be shamed for. Mm. And it's as though men have to be a one size fits all type of man. And we are just shoved into that. So it's scary to, to step out and, and, and step out of that and explore your shame. Um, it's deeply uncomfortable, but on the other side of it is just authenticity. It's liberation. It's freedom. It's joy. It's pleasure. So many amazing things. It's, um, yeah, it's interesting you say that, like, cause I was, as you were speaking, I was like, man, like what are the ways that I see in, in myself and also in my clients that we're shamed. And, you know, you mentioned the man box, like anything that's kind of outside of that, you know, I kind of, I don't know all the rules off the top of my head. Um, actually <laughs> I can tell you cause I've got, I've got, I've got it as a gift actually, for some reason I've got, <laughs> not a gift, sorry. Um, no, it is a gift, but it's just an image. It's like, Part of the man box, the rules are like you don't cry openly or express emotion except anger um, mm-hmm. and lust. I think lust should also be there. Um, yeah, you don't express any weakness or fear. You demonstrate mm-hmm. power and control, especially over women. Um, aggression and dominance. Be a protector. Not to be like a woman. To be heterosexual. To not be like a gay guy. To be tough, athletic, um, strong, and courageous. To make decisions and and doesn't need any help to do that and to view women as, as property and objects. Wow. And yeah, it's a strong mm. list, isn't it? <laughs> and mm. when you live your life in that way, you know, outside the social norms, like when you show up, you're going to be shamed for a lot of things, right? You're, if you, you know, cause I was looking at like, where do I feel that I've been shamed? And I see my clients, it's like showing emotion, for instance, you know, is a big one for a lot of my clients, anxiety and um, fear, even, and also, <laughs> um, like, and I guess this is a slightly different one, is like not showing emotion, right? I know a lot of men have been shamed for not showing emotion. I know that's inside the man box, but there's a kind of dualistic nature to this shame and man box. I'll, I'll mention at the end, you know, some men I, I know just feel shame for being a man. Like just because I'm a man and man have done so many, men have done so many terrible things in the world. You know, like I, I feel that sometimes as like, you know, you're walking along the street, late in the evening and you're walking and there's a woman in front of you. And this used to happen to me so much when I lived in London, because I, I walk quite quickly and I've always lived near tube stations. Right. So I'll get out of the tube and I'm very intentional. It's like, 
It's 10 30 at night. It's late. I'm tired. I want to get home. And I've just finished in the gym. I'm walking and there's a woman ahead of me, maybe could be like 30 years. Right. And I'm thinking like, oh shit, I'm going to catch her in about three minutes. Mm. Right. Not in any malicious way. I use the word catch, but I mean, I'm going to catch up to her in three minutes. And then there's going to be a really awkward moment of a couple of minutes where she realizes that I'm coming up behind her. Right. And she sees this big black man walking behind her and she has two thoughts in her mind. One of them is like, is he going to rob me? Right. Let's be mm. honest. Right. <laughs> Long before, before George Floyd, that was a, a, a very common thing to think. And no one was kind of shamed for, no women were shamed for thinking that. And the second thing is like, am I going to try and sexually assault her or try and talk to her in some way? Yeah. And it used to be like, oh God, okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk. I'm going to walk with my head down. And I'm going to walk as far away from where she is as I can on the pavement without crossing over. Because it's like, I don't want to cross over the road because I also have a right to walk on this road. But, you know, just being a man left me with that kind of feeling of shame that she's going to think that I'm some sort of predator. You know, Mm. men feel shame for not having power. Um, Men feel shame for being weak as well. Again, the man box is, is one of them as well. Finances and money, there's a lot of shame that comes up. And as you said, wanting sex, there's, you know, a lot of those things, a man box stuff. You're not in the man box, you're shamed. And now we have like a new second layer, right? Which is, let's call it the conscious man box, right? (laughs) So the conscious man is expressing his emotions. He is clued up on feminism. He's trying to share power. Um, You know, he understands the the history of men. He's um, aware of racial and gender issues in the world and so forth. And he's not... He doesn't really want sex. He wants deep connection. And then there's actually a shaming for men, not all men, because if you don't experience this, you don't experience this when you're not being that man. Right. Mm. (laughs) And I definitely, I feel this sometimes like, you know, Oh, I want to, I see women on the street and I'm like, wow, she's hot. She's like, man, she's sexy. I can feel like I can feel a rising of energy as I'm walking towards. And it's like, Oh, David, you shouldn't feel like that because you're Mm. a conscious man. You shouldn't be feeling like that. And I'm like, Oh shit. Yeah. Head down, suppress that. Or, um, you know, realizing that you have kind of influence in the world, right? And you're like, okay, I'm trying to use my influence for a positive way. And I'm, then you go, like, oh, but am I using it for a positive? Am I using it to like make money or, or am I harming people? Um, am I using my, my conscious awareness to belittle other people? It's almost like, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I see this with some of my clients, especially around emotions. You know, I work with a lot of men who struggle to express their emotions and they're in relationship and they're like, I'm being shamed by my partner for not expressing how I feel, not being able to express my emotions correctly and blah, blah, blah. And it's almost like I say is, you know, we're all feeling some shame (laughs) in some way, right? Um, For the many different levels and layers of of masculinity. Um, But it's interesting just to see how like most of that shame is, is most of it comes from ourself to ourself. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, going deeper into that, you know, at some point we internalized an external message from someone or something, an event, a person where that part of ourself wasn't, was, was rejected. It was humiliated. It was whatever. So we've gone, right. Okay. Well, that part of me isn't safe. I'm going to suppress that. I'm going to, that, and now that part of me is not allowed to be seen it's not allowed to be expressed that is now shamed you know many many men call it you know put it into our shadow it's part you know part of shadow work is bringing this stuff out um one of the biggest problems i've seen with clients that i work with is they become aware that they are experiencing challenging emotions that they don't know how to like they don't know how to deal with and they shame themselves for not being able to solve that problem Mm. so they're you know, experiencing anxiety and they shame themselves for not being able to solve the anxiety. So they're not just shaming the anxiety itself. They're shaming their inability to solve the anxiety. So it becomes about who they are as like at the, like the deepest level, they're shaming who they are and what they think they should be able to do. Um, You know, they shame themselves for, getting triggered um they shame themselves for feeling overwhelmed they shame themselves for not being present 
and they're like, I should be able to be present and I can't. So I'm not fucking good enough. And it's like, yeah, it's, there's, there's how we feel. And then there's how we feel about how we feel. And that's where the shame comes in. Mm. And it's, it's so interesting because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the process at the moment, right. Within my business and working with men of kind of like productizing what I do. I'm trying to come up with like catchy names for the processes I go through to help men do this and help them do that. One of them that I'm kind of toying with at the moment is this idea of emotional mastery. So this idea of mastering your emotions, right? Because let's be honest, on a surface level, that sounds fucking fantastic. Master your emotions, dominate, control, feel what you want to feel. Don't, don't feel what you don't want to feel, right? Master your emotions. Actually, what we want to do there is we want to unshame and allow the full freedom and full, full expression of our emotions. Yeah. So, you know, probably just giving away my secrets to any men that I might work with in the future. Um, we will be, <laughs> we will be, you know, ex- learning to express and learning to unshame the emotions that we carry. Because when we, yeah, when we experience emotions that we have learned are not okay to have as men and to feel as men, that's where shame comes in. If we can remove the shame, then all of a sudden it becomes okay to feel anxious. It becomes okay to feel overwhelmed. It becomes okay to get triggered. And obviously once we remove the shame, then we can go into, let's get curious. Let's unpack what's going on there. Let's figure out some stuff. Let's learn about who I am. Let's learn about why I'm reacting that way. And we can, you know, not that we need to be fixed, but we can improve. We can deepen our ability to sit in those emotions. Mm. Mm, yeah emotional mastery it's um it's funny you said master emotions i've got a i've got a four-week program called master your emotions that i wrote a number of years ago and and it's very much along the lines of what you're saying though it's mm. we want to be able to control fix get rid of right mm. our feelings and actually the way to the way to do that is to feel them <laughs> is to feel them to be with them, be present with them, you know, give them space to be felt and also to, you know, look at like, oh, why am I feeling shame when my partner asked me what time I'm coming home? Yeah. Like, why do I get reactive in those moments? Okay. Oh, I think it's because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, it's that my mum used to do that. It feels controlling. And then I feel like I must be doing something wrong. And I have, oh, oh, I have shame around like my own ability to be free and do my own thing. And, you know, what I'm getting from what you're saying is like, it gives us a curiosity to the emotions are still there, but the mastery comes in how we deal with them, our relationship to them. Instead of them being like, um, you know, like the rough sea, you know, this, I, I use, I use a surfing analogy. It's like, it's like what you think you want is to be able to like hover above the sea, the rough sea and just, and just like not engage in them at all. But actually the reality of it is you become an adept surfer and you're able to like ride the waves and not be crashed around with them, which sometimes is going to happen. And you're meant to ride mm-hmm. your way back to shore instead of being like absolutely smashed against the rocks at any given moment without any warning or understanding and feeling overwhelmed and feeling like you're drowning. That's the kind of analogy that I, yeah. I see with the, with the emotions there. Yeah, I think it's, um, and look, you know, we can, I guess if we liken it to let's say masculine and feminine dynamics, or I I kind of lean more towards like yin and yang. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's always wanting to be in the doing, always wanting to be like, right. I want to, I want to master these emotions. I want to dominate these emotions. I want to be able to control them. And actually it's all about surrendering, letting go of the need to control, feel into them, be okay feeling them. That's actually where the mastery comes in is Mm -hmm. letting go of the need to control or, yeah, letting go of the need to actually control those emotions. Yeah, yeah, and that's where we, that's where we gain that real, real mastery. Um, there. Mm. And I, and I'm also thinking it's like when we've got these kind of traditional the man box, these traditional ideas of masculinity. Um, I guess how do we kind of unhook ourselves from? the shame that is produced from, you know, that style of masculinity as, as men kind of individually, but also collectively. Um, 
yeah, it's hard. I think it starts on, I think it starts on an individual level. Get get familiar. Like my journey with shame started with learning about what shame was and then learning about where it was showing up in my life. So I sat down and I wrote a list. And like I say, I remember, yeah, there was like sex, there was sexual desire, there was sexual expression, there was um, attraction. But then, you know, I looked at, you know, I've been shamed my for, for a lot of my life for things like my self-expression and, you know, which a lot of men are because, you know, you know I started painting my nails last year. Mm. Because it was, for me, I saw other people do it and I thought, mm, I like that. I like the idea of the conversations that will start. I like the idea of how painting my nails will, will challenge people around me to perceive men and masculinity. Um, you know, I remember being, a, and when I've done a bit of work on, for example, shaming self-expression, right? I remember going back to being a kid. My dad would always... I mean, I was a, I was an expressive, wild, wacky, bit of a weird kid, right? I was a little weirdo putting on silly voices, acting in silly ways because it felt fun to me. And I remember my dad always used to say to me, you should, you should be an actor. Like you should, you should, you know, like I was like a little Jim Carrey, you know, Mm. like could it could have played those sorts of characters. But then when I would act in those ways in front of people and I would act in those ways in, you know, at at parties in front of his friends and he was embarrassed, obviously I would be told, James, stop that. You know, and I could feel I could feel the, the embarrassment of my dad and I could feel like that visceral reaction that he was going through where he felt like, you know, oh, his son's being a bit strange. And so he didn't nurture he when it was safe to, he would nurture it and celebrate it. But when it wasn't, he would judge it and he would shame it. Mm. And so, yeah, that became something that I, you know, became conflicting within me and I learned to suppress. So, you know, I, I think it comes from look at any areas of your life, any areas of your feelings, your thoughts, your emotions, your experiences, where you feel not good enough, not worthy. You feel that you have to hide. You feel like you would be embarrassed if people saw. And just write and write and write, write everything that comes up for you. Journal on it, meditate on it. And yeah, get curious. Start thinking, where's that come from? Hmm. When, when, when did I... When did I learn to feel that way about myself? Is you go back far enough, you might be able to, you would likely be able to find a time where you didn't feel ashamed for that part of you. And yeah, I think if we, (coughs) I think if we focus on it on an individual level, we can then start to change and collectively unshame who we are as men, who we are as humans, you know, have, have conversations about this stuff. You know, it's, you said it earlier when you talked about the benefits of men's circles, the most, one of the most healing parts of what a men's circle is and what it gives to men is it unshames the part of parts of themselves that they thought were wrong with them. Because when other men share their experiences and other men share that they're having the same experience or a similar experience what happens inside of us is you know something called a disconfirming experience it Mm. disconfirms the shame that we felt and have held over that part of us because we go oh my god other people feel that way i thought it was just me Mm. so it's you know do your own shame work and you know like figure it out identify it get curious about it, challenge it, you know, compassionately and, and, and share it. You know, I say I've, I've sat on this podcast now and, and shared that I, you know, started going to sex parties last year and have an open relationship. And, you know, I dated an escort last year and all of these things that people will go, 
let's judge him. That's a, mm. that's shameful. That's embarrassing. That's, you know, and, and people will hear that. People might hear that because it will, but you know, anything that, anything that people judge when they hear it is obviously something that they would judge within themselves. Like mm. we know that about judgment. So, um, yeah, man, unshaming, unshaming who we are individually and collectively. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge. And it's, it's just an incredibly like necessary, much needed process. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I feel the world will become a safer place for all people when we, and I'm just going to talk about men, when we men experience less shame and we project less shame on top of the people. Um, cause as you said, when, when we're in groups and I've done this in like men's circles, um, I've done it in big retreats, 60 people retreats, um, and seen shame literally almost physically leave people where people were standing in a circle and they get up and share in the middle of a circle and they start sharing some emotion and feeling and start expressing it through movement sound or, or whatever. And then they look around and they look at each of the per- people in that circle and there's people looking at them, smiling, accepting them. I've seen them like have a second, not I won't call it a breakdown, but it's like a, a release of like, oh my God, I can do that. And no one's going to think any less of me in this space. No one's going to think yeah. any less of me. And that that is absolutely transformational, you know, and mm. you can get that in big groups um, through retreat or or men's circles, but you can also do that one-on-one, right? And I imagine you've seen yeah. this in, in your own work. It's like, you know, I one of the things I often do when someone comes to me for coaching, the first time we speak, I just tell them, I'm here to listen. Whatever you want to talk about, I'm here to listen. And I, exp- I, have, I tell them that, you know, the wide expression, experience of different types of men that I've had, you know, men that have been cheating, men who have never been, you know, never had sex, men that haven't been on dates for for years and all these things. And I'm like, I got so much compassion for all these situations and I understand how we get there. So I'm here to listen to you. Like, tell me what's happening with you. And I've had men talk for 15 minutes. I've heard men talk for 90 minutes, right? And I see after that, the shame start to dis- dissipate from them because they're like, oh my God, I shared it with this man who mm. I don't know. <clears throat> and he didn't judge me. He was curious about how I was feeling. He understood and empathized with what was going on for me. And through just some questioning, we start to see some solutions to the problems that I'm having. And just in that, like that in itself is a transformational structure to be in, you know, that's part of the transformational structure of coaching. It's just like Mm. this non-judgmental space of listening because it's so, um, it's so revolutionary in comparison to the, the world that we normally live in right? Which is, as we've we've talked about, is full of judgment and shame. And when there's no judgment um, and there's compassion and there's curiosity, shame falls away, you know? Shame just starts to drop drop off us. um, Yeah. Either instantly or over time. Yeah. Beautiful. um, A beautiful quote that I heard. I can't remember the guest. I think it was on the Man Enough podcast with Justin Baldoni. And one of their guests, was asked, you know, what does it mean to be a man? And their response was, and I'm probably going to butcher this, but it was something along the lines of to be a man is to create a safe world where everyone can be themselves and mm. express themselves, including men. Mm. So it's about, for me, when I read between those lines, I think it's about removing shame creating spaces for us to remove our shame and i and i yeah i really believe that if men work on unshaming themselves and resolving and healing and letting go of the shame that they carry over who they are yes they'll be stepping outside of that man box yes they'll be you know leaving behind ultimately what is you know a system a systemic structure and an ideal about what men should be which ultimately comes out of actually we come back to positive intention that's been kind of built to keep men safe. I do this and you'll, and you'll be fine. Mm. Right. If we step outside of that, we are then by virtue of going through that process, open ourselves up to 
you know, help, giving permission, other people permission to unshame themselves, regardless of gender, identity, race, uh, ability, where you're from. And man, what a beautiful world that would be to live in. Mm. Mm. Amen. Mm. And that feels, that feels a tremendous place to, to wrap up actually. A nice, like a very nice spot um, mm. there. And what a tremendous conversation that we've weaved through, you know, with, with, with men and friendship and, and masculinity and shame as well, you know, reducing shame, which is, you know, as you said there, it's like, it can heal the world. Mm. Yeah. Big thank you, James. Big thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure. Um, and yeah, I'd love you to tell the listeners where they can get more of you, where they can come work with you and even uh, any programs or where you've got you also got the, the men's group that you're also running. Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, I mean, Instagram is always the, the first place. So, um, yeah, I'd say come and find me over. I've just started a new one specifically for my coaching. So it's just James Oliver underscore men's coach. Um, yeah, obviously, I work with men one to one. So feel free to drop me a DM if you have any questions about anything that's come up in this, you know, in, in this podcast. Um, happy just to, yeah, like any, any questions about anything, please just drop me a DM. I'm always happy to just have a conversation. Um, yeah, we've also got the um, so one brotherhood, which is at we are one brotherhood on Instagram. Um, that is actually predominantly hosted away from social media. So at the moment, it's a WhatsApp community and just makes it really accessible for people. We can drop in and out, you know, pick it up, put it down whenever you want. Um, we don't bombard you with messages all the time. Um, but, you know, we host through there. We, you know, have a broadcast channel where we would send out, you know, a monthly community call. We've also, um, yeah, we're, we're um, Harry and I are a couple of weeks away. I don't know when this will go out, but we're um, we're creating at the moment um, an eight week men's circle all all around unshaming masculinity and diving into the various aspects of who we are as men and how we can heal that heal that shame and yeah, just just step into more of who we are and more of our authenticity. So yeah, and um, also yeah, in, in I think yeah by by June we should have season one of the Boys Toilets podcast with me and my buddy Jamie. Um, for which uh, David and another wonderful man called Alex were, were guests on. So, yeah, pl- plenty of ways that you can that we can we can catch up and and have a chat. So, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Mm, awesome. I'll be putting all, all those all those links will be down below in the show notes for you to just click through nice and easily, and nice and smoothly if that's what you want. Um, mm. But yeah, man, James, thank you for for being you. Thank you for showing up today with this wonderful knowledge and you know the vulnerability to share so much of your personal experience and journey and, and ride thank you mate and thank you for having me on I you know love talking to you every time we do so um yeah i feel like we had a, a wonderful conversation thank you mm. and listeners if you've enjoyed this episode you know share it with somebody someone who you know maybe is you know struggling to create the friendships you know there's a lot of men out there you know that struggle for for friendships and they're wanting to create deeper friendships and maybe don't know some of the resources um, where they can, you know, and some of the ways that they can shift and change the, the friendships they have. And, you know, potentially men who are also um, dealing with shame, shame around their own masculinity, their own way of being. Um, this episode would definitely be a valuable resource for them, for them to, A, not feel alone, and B, to, you know, use some of the tools that we talked about to to unburden that shame and, and shift into a new way of being, a new way of living. So, you know, until next week, I guess. Uh, listeners um, ciao ciao I want to say a big thank you for listening you know it's people like yourself that really help get the podcast out into the world you know especially if you're often sharing the episodes and the podcast with people that you th- you feel just could do of listening right can see a different way of being a man maybe a different way of having dating lives and intimacy and relationships so i want to say a big thank you and if maybe after listening to this episode you think oh there's someone actually you could really do with this please share it with them you know share the love i'm really really grateful and if you know you want to get in contact with me for any questions or you want to talk about coaching or any working together, feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at theauthenticman underscore, or you can email me hello at theauthenticman.net. Thank you very much.